coming out to CBW for our uh, weekly Meet the Artist. Um, my name is Sarah Danziger. I'm the Education Program Manager here. I have a couple announcements and then we'll get to the main act. Um, I want to announce that we, uh, we just launched our summer workshops. We have 10 or 11 really, really wonderful workshops, one of which uh, you will be teaching. I think this will be your third year teaching it. Um, and it's always very popular and always very fun. So uh, please, if you're interested in learning wet plate or just getting back under that dark cloth and shooting behind a four by five again and, and smelling, some smelling some ether, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll be doing that again. That'll be fun. Um, so, and those are all on our website. So please, if you have any questions, you can email me at education at cpw.org and I will tell you all about it. Uh, we also have an opening this weekend. You're kind of getting a sneak peek of it. Um, the nature of having one space right now over here is that you get to see our shows as they're being hung. Um, this show is called Counter Histories and it's in partnership with Magnum Foundation. Uh, and the Aperture's launch, uh, Aperture's latest issue it features all the projects that were part of, uh, that were awarded the Magnum Foundation fellowships for these works. So that'll be really nice. And it's gonna be followed by a little party. So if you like to party and you wanna come schmooze afterwards, let me know and I'll put you on the list. Um, we also have tickets on sale right now for our Vision Awards, honoring Nan Golden and An Mei Lee and uh, Edward and um, uh, Keisha Scarville won our inaugural uh, Saltzman Prize. So that's, and she's gonna be there. Um, and also we'll be honoring best book of the year, or book, photo book of the year, which is, uh, the collaborations. Um, and one last thing I will announce, um, which is that we, uh, we just closed our Woodstock Air program for uh, open call. So we have 10 artists and residents that will be joining us this year. They're all phenomenal. I hope you check out their work. Um, many of them will be doing artist talks this summer. So uh, that's always a fun thing to do when they're here. Um, they were chosen out of 200 artists. So they're, they're pretty phenomenal. Okay, so you did who we have tonight, I'm gonna to read a bio. Uh, Judith German Hines is a Hungarian American photographer who ri resides in Kingston, New York. She received her MFA in photography and integrated media at Lesley University College of Art and Design in 2023. She creates handmade images using historical photographic processes, which connects her main interests in humanity, politics, and history. Her images and portfolios have been awarded by the New York Center for Photography, the Worldwide Photography Gala Awards, the Houston Center for Photography, the, Ga the Gallery Photographica, um, and Photographers Forum Magazine. She was a Critical Mass finalist in 2023 and 2019. Um, we need you in 2024. <laughs> Numerous of her works were selected for jury group shows in Houston, New York, Spain, and Germany. Her article, Tintype Portraits, a 19th Century Process Documents, 21st Century Society, was published in October 2018 issue of the Big Photo Zine. During 2024, Udit will take portraits of women in upstate New York whose work is related to the Erie Canal as an artist in residence for the Erie Canal Museum. I'm really excited for that. Her tintypes will pay tribute to women workers during the construction of the Erie Canal and also to those who fought for women's rights starting from the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. I'll also add that Edith's work uh, photographing local immigrants is featured for like another year yeah. uh, at the Rear Center. And those are stunning. And the Rear Center is really wonderful here in Kingston. So please take a look. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to announce Judith. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you. Can you hear me? And uh, hello. And thank you, CPW, for having me. It's a great honor. I, I love to be part of this community. I think it's a really great little community where you can learn a lot from people and, um, and make connections. Um, went silent. Um, so um, I'm going to be uh, presenting four different projects that I worked on. Two of them are portraiture based, so bear with me. If you don't like portraiture, there's gonna be some other stuff after that. Um, but before that, um, I'm gonna say a few things about me. Um, 
I didn't take photography course in high school. Um, I didn't go to college to study photography. Um, but when I was eight years old, I got a little camera, a little Russian camera from my dad. It was a Smena 8, I think. It was one of those that you couldn't focus. Um, you have to kind of guess what the distance was between the camera and the object you were photographing. And um, that you can, um, you know, drop from the 10th floor and run down, pick it up and, and start shooting because um, it was a Russian camera. So, um, so instead of being a photographer, I was also interested in science. So I became a geologist. And I was working as such until I realized that I, um, I cared more about um, the human experience than the psyche of rocks. So um, photography was a, was a good avenue or a good tool to kind of express my frustration with certain issues that I cared about um, in society. So um, I'm going to start with one of my projects that was such. Um, a long journey home. Um, this, the idea of this project came along in 2015. I'm from Hungary. So I don't know if you guys remember that what happened in 2014 and 15 when Syrian refugees started to migrate north, um, trying to reach um, uh, Germany. And my country, uh, my beautiful country of Hungary, closed the doors in front of them. So all the borders were closed, they didn't let them through. They were stuck in, um, in the border um, in the former Yugoslavia, south of it in Serbia and Croatia, and kind of trying to go around um, the country. And I was so outraged that uh, this was a humanitarian crisis and it was so politicized that, um, that uh, I was just really outraged what happened. So I started to volunteer with two, um, uh, refugee settlement agencies in, in Houston, Texas. Um, the interface ministries of uh, Greater Houston um, Refugee Services and Amano Refugee Services. So one of them uh, served the refugees who came in at the very beginning when they had um, when they had uh, government support for three months. And after that, Amano Refugee Services took it over. Um, and help them kind of the settlement process. So I volunteered and I was uh, mentoring families and I was also kind of the pro bono photographer for them. And then what happened in 2016, we probably all know what happened in 2016, um, Trump was elected. And, um, and I, was, I was working with the refugees in, in Amman, Amana when the, the, the news came that uh, of the uh, of the Muslim ban, so I was with Muslim people, and uh, it was it was panic because they their funding was was gone and everything. So that's when I realized that I, I I needed to use my pick up my camera and start photographing, and that was about the time when I learned Webbit Collodion. So my idea was to uh, to take pictures of of refugees. Um, and kind of connect these new, re new, new, new refugees who um, were already kind of making their way into American society and connect them with refugees or immigrants who came in the 19th century when this technique was used. So this is an example of Augustus Sherman who, uh, who was photographing refugees, documenting them in, at Ellis Island. So I wanted to create a link between uh, between those images and my images. And um, so this was one of my first um, uh, subject, uh, Hall from Afghanistan. He came um, in 1980 by himself, um, fleeing of Afghanistan and uh, started out as a pizza, dip, you know, he was dibbling pizza and eventually working for um, Continental Airlines in, in Houston and then after retirement, he joined the military. So what he was really uh, proud of is that he never took a cent from the government. He said, I, I would never take any money from the country that helped me uh, to overcome um, you know, all the torture and whatever I lived through in Afghanistan. 
And this lady um, is a Yazidi. Um, I don't know if you guys know what y Yazidis um, are not Muslim. They are they are Kurdish um, people who live. Uh, this lady lived in Iraq, but they are in Turkey and um, uh, and um, in, in the region. And they were persecuted um, in 2014, something 15, something like that. And this lady. Um, you know, went through becoming a refugee. This is her her uh, granddaughter um, who was 13 at the time when I photographed. So she was about 11 years old when she was uh, she was running away from basically a genocide that was going on in in, in northern Iraq by the uh, Islamic State. This is Abdul um, from Pakistan. He uh, he was a refugee from Pakistan to Turkey. So he was in a refugee camp in Turkey for years before he got asylum in the US. He was very young. When I photographed him, he was maybe 21. So, and he'd been there in Houston for about two or three years with his huge family, like seven or eight people living in a, in a, in a two bedroom apartment for many years. Um, and he's a fantastic um, artist. Sumer Iraq, he's an actor uh, who, who ran from Iraq. Um, Dina, she's also from Iraq. She was seven years old when the Americans invaded Iraq, uh, hiding on, under, under a blanket when they were bombing. And luckily her family could escape because her dad was an engineer working for an American company. So, um, and then she became a human rights activist working in the DC area right now. Um, this is Hussein from, there were a lot of Somalians um, who were in, in Houston. Um, many of them went, wound up going north to Minnesota where there was even a bigger supportive community for them. But he came, he, he stayed in Houston and he was a translator for one of the uh, agencies. Um, he's a uh, the Rohingya, Rohingya, um, uh, genocide was in 2017, and I think I took this photo in 2018. So he just he just escaped um, Myanmar, and uh, and he didn't even speak English when when I, I took his photograph. And finally, um, this is a Bosnian woman who who f fled the Bosnian war. So so I, I I get really connected with these people. Most most of them are Muslim, um, and um, and with my work, with my um, work with with refugees, um, I got connected with an with a um, an organization called the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. And even if I, it, it was a it's an organization between Jewish and Muslim women. Um, and even if I'm I'm not religious, and um, I I te I'm technically you know 63 percent Jewish, but um, I'm not a practicing Jew. Um, they wanted me to um, to join the organization. Um, they were so their 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 slogan is that if you know if you know each other, um, then hate just dissipates, it disappears. So um, I got connected with them, and then when Trump was elected, and we lived in Houston, there were a lot of attacks against Muslims, Muslim women, particularly because they were recognized on the streets because of their headscarf. And also Jewish cemeteries were vandalized. So, um, so I, I uh, started to make a project of taking pictures of my, of my sisters in the sisterhood and it kind of, kind of grew. Uh, so I was photographing women who, who covered their heads um, wailing. So regardless of their face, so this is a Jewish woman um, who covers, um, and I was I was spending a lot of time in the in the studio with them because this process is really slow. I mean, you guys who uh, who took my course, you know, taking a photograph with wet collodion, it 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 involves a little work. So um, I spent two to three hours with each each one, taking maybe six or seven images. So, and during that time, I was talking to them, uh, their experience and uh, with being, um, you know, being covered. And, and I was curious about, 
the role of of the veil in their lives. And they, regardless of religion, they they said obviously that um, their main role or of covering is um, is just to being modest in front of God, and also it provides them a sense of community. Um, and I was also kind of curious about the you know politicizing the hijab and uh, and uh, you know turning it into or, or Islam Islamophobia uh, uh, you know manifesting itself as as kind of going after uh, hijabi women and um, I uh, I was starting to think about and reading about the history of wearing a hijab which goes back to um, the uh, the 3,500 years to uh, to Assyria when the first text was find found about um, uh, putting a very so um, re uh, requiring women, children, and women, girls, and and widows to wear a hijab um, for piety. So to me, it was it was obviously. Um, a result of misogyny and and control, and I was I was curious what they thought about it. And talking to them about about that, they all said that it is their choice to wear the hijab. It's it, they don't view it as a requirement. And with that, um, I thought that um, even if even if um, request or requiring you know head coverings to women um, started out as a misogynistic um, and uh, oppressive um, uh, law, um, it's, it's so embedded in their culture and in their religion that they, these women actually use their, their, their head coverings as a defiance against um, Western culture. So this is their choice that they can wear the hijab or, or, or any head coverings. And with that, they, um, they ex express their, um, their uh, community within their religion and also kind of fight against this uh, Western you know, need to be visible. So with the hijab, they are kind of keep their um, um, keep their privacy uh, being invisible, um, and this this is their choice, and then they can they can practice that. So um, so so with, with these projects, you know, uh, photographing, you know, taking portraits, um, I I always learned a lot from the people I photographed, and and it was more like a journey than the you know result is you know these these portraits but also it made me kind of grow personally, um, just talking to this woman and, and getting their perspective of, of the world, of their view of the world. Yeah, and then also the hijab or the hijab can be a fashion statement and, and this woman actually uses that very well. She is an engineer for NASA, so... Um, and she uh, she likes to dress up this I don't know this, she calls it some kind of Japanese kind of style with a hijab so she's very creative and um, certainly makes a fashion statement of their of the, her outfit. So I got through the uh, or the portraits. Um, so um, what happened after my time in Houston is that we finally managed to escape Texas and migrated towards New York. And um, our idea was to live in New York City. And so it was 2019. So we, uh, we drove up and I gave up my, my studio I had for $200 a month in Houston, a nice big studio. And I came to New York City and I had nothing. So what I did is, was that I enrolled in the ICP and one of my classmates is here. Thank you for coming in. And, um, and the main reason was, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going back to school. But um, ICP provided a stable studios and a 
equipment and dark room that I really needed. So um, that was my that was my idea that I'm gonna be in a community. I'm gonna be able to do work. And the the program started on in January 2020. So we know what happened after that. So within two months, everything was shut down. Uh, everything went online. We had no studio. We had no dark room. We had no nothing. So um, we were kind of mad about it, but uh, what I did was I needed a dark room. So I picked up some cardboard boxes and then put it in my shower. And um, I had a dark room in my shower. And, uh, and after a while I started to take photos uh, about, um, about control of, uh, of, the, of the virus that what it meant to me. And, uh, and then the whole world in my, in my mind was falling apart. So I made some images about that. So these are all Vapid Colonia, obviously. And so one day I walked into the grocery store, was trying to get some meat, and there was no meat in the grocery store except for chicken feet. And in Hungarian cuisine, chicken feet is a delicacy, and it's probably the same in Chinese as well or some places in the world. And, and I pick up some chicken, and so I was going to make some soup. And I know Americans don't like chicken soup with feet in it because there's just, those legs are coming out like that and it's really disgusting for them. That's what I heard from my from my um, godmother when she immigrated here that they just don't like the feet. So I was trying to kind of imagine that this this chicken kind of taken, taken over the world for me and um, kept control of the world. So, and uh, the interesting thing was that uh, there was this black thing in the middle. And as I was keeping it in the fridge, it was just getting bigger and bigger. So in my mind, there was something growing in there, something, you know, it was very disgusting. So I started to photograph it, taking still life with, with chicken feet, uh, <laughs> like controlling my life and uh, creating a nice bouquet. And, um, and taking over all the world and uh, keeping everything under control. Um, that's a that's a beef heart that the chicken feet is standing on, and behind it is a Hungarian uh, uh, liqueur. It's called Unicum um, that cures everything they say, and it does if you can stay on your feet after you drink it. <laughs> And this, I took this after my favorite photographer, Andre. Oops, sorry. How do I go back? Andre. Andre Katis. Um, he uh, he made some some still life with with forks and stuff, and was trying to kind of um, pay homage to to that. And the chicken feet trying to escape. Hello. And this is the final one. I call this desperation, the last toilet paper. Yeah. We all remember the running for the toilet paper in the during the pandemic because they were sparse and and far in between. So yep. And my last project is um, is my MFA thesis project. Um, that came upon, again, a disaster in my life. Um, so um, I was in, in my first summer in between my first and second year. And I was gonna, you know, that was, that was a time when we were supposed to produce uh, most of our images for the thesis project. And I had a project in mind and I was kind of like gearing up to do that when when the Dubs decision came down. And so I was, um, 
it really freaked me out. I'm, I'm, I'm in my 50s, so it's not going to affect me. I will never get pregnant um, anymore. But it just brought me so much uh, grief. And I was thinking about my, my children. I have two daughters and, and uh, what's going to happen with them. And I, I went through myself. I was, um, I was fortunate to have, have an abortion when I was in my, in, my, in my teens. And I was unfortunate to have to have an abortion, a third term abortion later on uh, that I, I, I got to do. And I was thinking of um, with this, this act again being, um, being you know, misogyny and oppression and you, know, you all, all know the, the results of that. And so I decided to, to do a project um, related to that. So this project, uh, A Monster in the Shape of a Woman, is centered on my experience as a woman, a survivor, and a host. My images are drawn from stories, dreams, and from personal perspective about my own lived experiences. They illustrate struggles that I and many women have faced throughout their life. The loss of a child, abortion, sexual abuse, and living with patriarchal expectations. I am curious about the complexity of the female body, and I am interested in being woman biologically, socially, and historically. My title comes from the poem Planetarium by Adrian Rich, which to me represents the universal struggles of women through, through a tribute to an astronomer, Caroline Herschel, the first woman professional scientist. Um, and I had kind of a, you know, we are, we are kind of connecting through photography with Caroline Herschel because her brother, uh, well, not because of that, but so her brother was William Herschel who discovered Uranus. Um, and she, she did all the calculations for him. So my question is, did he discover uh, discovered it, or did Caroline discover it? And also, um, the connection with photography is that her her um, her nephew is Sir John Herschel. Does anybody know who, who that is? So he uh, he was a gentleman who discovered how to fix the image. So without him, there wouldn't be photography um, in a sense that you know. Um, that we, we, we do it now. now. Um, and he was also photographed by Julia uh, Margaret Cameron. Um, I don't know if you probably know that image, just not knowing. Those. He has this big, huge white hair and he looks kind of, kind of, uh, you know, like somber on the picture. Um, it's a beautiful image and I really like, like her work anyway. So I had some connection through um, with Caroline, through Adrian Rich as well, and then I love her her poem. So I'm gonna be um, reading her poem uh, and my writing during this presentation. A woman in the shape of a monster, a monster in the shape of a woman. The skies are full of them. A woman in the snow among the the clocks and instruments or measuring the ground with poles in her 98 years to discover eight comets. She whom the moon ruled, like us, levitating into the night sky, riding the polished lenses. Galaxies of women there doing penance and impetuousness. Rips chilled in those spaces of the mind. And I, we are all precise and absolutely certain from the mad webs of Uranusburg encountering the Nova.
every impulse of, of light exploding from the core as life flies out of us. Tycho whispering at last, let me not seem to have lived in vain. Microchimerism is a phenomenon when an organism contains a small number of cells from another organism. It is named after the chimera, an evil female three-headed monster in the body of a lion, a goat, and a serpent in Greek mythology. The most common of such a cell exchange is between the mother and the fetus. Microchimerism may be responsible for a number of autoimmune diseases that mostly affect women. Through microchimerism, the female body becomes a living history. We carry the traces of our children, our aborted fetuses, our miscarried offspring for decades after they leave, out, leave, out of, leave our bodies. Through them, we also carry traces of our partners, our lovers and our attackers who are inadvertently affecting our lives and health forever. The female body is captive of its past, which may determine its future. I try to imagine that by the powers of the female monster, my lost son is still living in my aging body. What we see, we see, and seeing is changing. The light that shivers the mountain and leaves a man alive. <clears throat> Heartbeat of the pulsar, heart sweating through my body, the radio impulse pouring in from Taurus. I am bombarded, yet I stand. I have been standing all my life in the direct path of a battery of signals, the most accurate to transmitted, most untranslatable language in the universe. I am a galactic cloud so deep, so involuted that a light wave could take 15 years to travel through me and has taken. I am an instrument in the shape of a woman trying to translate pulsations into images for the relief of the body and the reconstruction of the mind. Thank you so much. <laughs> I take questions if you have any. Many of them. Okay, go ahead. Uh, technicality, I was totally blown away with the portrait photography. 
Oh, thank you. Using the rest of the technique. And does anyone have a photographer here? Everyone Probably everyone. Photography works. Yeah. It's like very little time to make it happen. But I was super impressed with the, with the lighting and the composition. So in order to achieve that, did you have to practice taking photos with the regular camera? And once you had that light set up and everything, that okay, now you just sit there and, and take the photo? Or how did it work? Because they just, they, they the quality of the sport photos and just knowing the technique, it was very impressive, like how to create the composition, the light, the sharpness, and everything. Oh, thank you. Well, so everyone who ever shot large, large format cameras um, knows that it's 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 not a point and shoot so with the with the with the um tin type or the weapon collodion technique coming into it that it takes um a long time to uh to get the people situated the iso is less than one so i have to i have to bombard them with 6400 uh, watts per second light um and as soon as you um you put in the plate, you can't see anything. So they have to sit very still um, in order to um, be able to take a, a decent image uh, for about, let's say, one or two minutes, right? So um, with, uh, these, these, these portraits were taken in studio, so I used strobes. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a part of the setup. You have to set up far ahead of time, you have to make sure that they get enough light. Um, so it's, 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 uh, it, it is difficult. But like in order to, to achieve it, like did you take like photos prior to the, to the regular camera? So this is no. approximately or just? No. Just, wow, that's, that's very impressive. No, you just have to tell them to. And sometimes I use, um, use a has stabilizer. So in the very old time, you probably saw those, those drawings or photographs when there's, there's that, long saying clamp that uh, that stabilizes their head so they wouldn't move and other technical question if you don't i was very impressed like the face is like super sharp mm -hmm. and that, and then it looks like it's a, it's a, a lens like a shallow depth of film yes but, uh, like the, the but the focal plane like it looked like it's sometimes like the, the neck is out of focus, but yeah. the same focal plane, the face is in focus. So that's also yeah. because the lens, like it's sharp in the center and, and blurs out yeah. towards the edges. Yeah, so I, I use I use um, historical lenses or um, there's a lens that's, um, that's a copy of a historical lens um, that, um, that use um, uh, is Waterhouse stops. So, uh, but they are, they are very, um, they have very shallow depth if you don't you don't change the aperture. So um, because of because of the ISO being so low, I have to I have to shoot um, wide open most of the time. So that's why the shallow depth of field. And then these lenses are probably 2.8, 3.5, and for a large format, that's that's a very very thin uh, depth of field that I need to use. And how, how can you control that? that very fine distance because you you we'll just make by, them by, sit by there. half an inch it's, it's gone and yeah i mean you have to make sure that they don't move so i have to tell them not to move and uh, usually tell them concentrate on your chin because if you don't move your chin you're not going to move your head uh, they can blink because i can kind of control that um you're just looking at them when i'm shooting but because uh, i'm using a strobe but um but there are frequent blinkers, so with those, you don't know what you get. You have to have six or seven plates, and then, yeah. But I, I, I also have a plate, so if someone doesn't know how it looks like in real, you can you can pass it around. Start over here. Um, these are varnish, so um, can, yep. And the first job is identifying the sitter by coming and. Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't put the names in there, but, but with that, I think uh, maybe it was 
it was an unconscious right decision because what I wanted to show is that they are, we are all the same. I wanted to include some Catholic nuns, but they are not very keen on sitting in front of the camera. Um, so just to show that all religions, there were, there were four different religions uh, represented in those um, portraits. And I, what I wanted to say, we are all the same, you know? Um, there we have all the, they all, all have the same reason to cover. There's no reason to kind of pick on the Muslim women um, because they're, they're all, we are all the same. Yes. Together? I did I did start doing that as well, but um I did it very early and those photos didn't really turn out very well. So I didn't didn't show that. These are much better. Um yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Second one. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a very broad question. You can answer however you want. But um, like, start off with like, a dry plate or like, wet plate. Like, what would your advice be? Between dry plate and wet plate? Yeah, like, because, like, even though, like, the, the chemical process is very different, but, like, choosing the composition and, like, okay. overall, like, how would you like, advise someone? So the difference between, so with dry plate, yeah. Um, the ISO is even lower. So the, expose, the exposures are minutes. <laughs> so dry plates are normally not used for portraits. They, they, they tend to be used for, for landscapes when the landscape normally doesn't move that quickly unless you're living in California. Um, so um, with wet plates, and, and I mean, dry, dry plate is also um, a good, good thing if you're traveling so you can get the dry dry place coated and then travel with it and you can pull it out on the field and shoot it and you don't have to develop it right away but with wet plates you have to set up a dark room and you have to shoot and develop right away um so i mean it it serves different purposes so it depends what you want um i never done dry plate um i don't know my projects are normally not landscapes so i probably won't um but there there are some excellent workshops if you're interested in dry plates or there's wet plate workshops too. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, the gentleman was next, sorry. Oh. Um, you, start, you say start out with a very simplistic camera, so then you gravitate to a process that's very difficult to master and to execute. What was kind of the, you said you didn't really know, know about the project you were studying and that you started with a much simpler 35 millimeter camera, but then you gravitated towards um, this um, large really format process. Yeah. And how that um, drew your set more so than just what a simpler, easier to use camera, modern camera would be. Not even digital, but just film. Well, actually, after film, I went to the digital because that was the thing to do. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason I did wet plate collodion, uh, learned wet plate collodion because because I was attracted to the look and also the, the process, you know, photography to me is not just the result, it's also the process. And the fact that you have to really slow down what, and then think about what you're doing um, in large format photography in general, but with web plate you even more because you, all, you have one shot in every maybe 20, 30 minutes. Um, that was very attractive to me. And then the whole thing is so meditative to me. Um, and also like being, with the chemistry that's also kind of make you meditative. Uh, so, um, um, so the reason, so the question was why, why I switched to that? No, just what was the feeling? Yeah, uh, the feeling was just, um, it's, I don't know, I just fell in love and then I needed to do it. Yeah. But how would you reproduce this picture to get it to project on the screen? So what I do when I, after I, after I take the photo and, you know, Develop it and fix it. Um, I wash it for a while and dry it. And when it's dry, it's still like fragile, but it's uh, it's not as bad. So I can I can scan it in. So I normally scan in my images before I varnish them. Um, Is it a flatbed scan? Yes. 
Interesting. Yeah. Yes. And what, because the tonality is totally different than what you project. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It is. Yeah, it's dark. I mean, yeah. You, you need a lot of light on tin types in general because um, they are not very reflective. I mean, there's silver in there, so it's reflecting. It's just a different kind of, um, you know. Um, because the projections are very beautiful as well. Oh, Even thank you, sir. The, the, you see what I'm saying? The, the, the appearance is totally different. Yes. But I like the, the how do you say that? The, the, the mistakes, mm -hmm. the imperfections. Yeah. I think that adds to the mystique of the photograph. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I'm curious, first of all, it's a beautiful work. Thank you. Quite stunning. Yeah. I'm curious, who are your photographic heroes? Oh, what on the Yeah. Yeah, um, certainly, the new photographers, Julia, Margaret Cameron, I like Sally Mann, um, Francesca Woodman, um, uh, black and mostly black and white photographers. Um, yeah. Yes. Along um, scans, can you actually trace out of those colors? Yeah. Um, yeah. You can print it out as a digital print. I also try to make a digital negative and copy them. It didn't work out that well. So mm -hmm. you don't get the tonalities back. Um, so what I was trying to do is. I create a digital negative, scan it in digital negative, and then project the digital negative within a larger onto a, a, a port plate. And I guess I, I tried it many years ago. Um, so with my knowledge of digital negatives now, after studying alternative processes, other processes, I think I can probably tweak the curve that it would kind of give a better outcome but it's extremely hard to reproduce it. I, I, I can't get, I, I, don't, I don't know if I, if I would be able to get back the same look. And in your process, so you have a unique print. Yes. And a unique object. Actually, is it more satisfying to you that, you know, at the end of this very lengthy process, you end up with just one unique plate as opposed to, you know, possibly between multiple yeah. Yeah, I know it's 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 a it's a satisfaction and also a heartache because I don't want to get rid of them. Okay, so it's it's hard to sell this work. Um, so I, my professor said, you just have to get used to it. You have to get rid of your babies. Like, but but it is hard. Yes. Yeah. The portraits are very beautiful. Then there's a few uh, portraits where the subject is looking away. I was wondering if that was your choice or the subject's choice. Um, it was one one instance. It was a subject choice, and a couple others. I don't know how many I showed that they were looking away. It was my choice, just to uh, because because of the the beauty of of the of the scarf that uh, I wanted to kind of portray. All the portrait photography was really like just it, it, as you described the technicality, the extremely small shutter speed, the subject have to sit there for a, a minute or two. What well, we really impressed me, like some even the, the texture of the hair, I'm like, because hair is very thin and it looks small as smooth, it should be blurry, but it's it's like sharp. I'm like, well, that's I mean, it's, it's also, detail, like, I was just so impressed. I mean, and it's also it's, the lens and the you know, the um. The camera and the lens, large format camera. I mean, that's those lenses are, are like that, and they are all lenses. Yeah, I understand that that's the most, but just the motion, you know, like yeah. it's it's so hard to sit still that long, and and even even then, like those fine details came out really. Yeah, I mean, the expo exposure itself is is just a stroke, so exposure itself is very short, uh -huh. and then I normally like either time it between blinks 
or I tell them, you know, not to blink. So that's achievable. And um, it's just, just the between setting, setting the focus and then putting the plate in and shoot. That's that's a tricky part. Uh -huh. So just to make sure they don't move during that time when I can't correct it. Yeah. Yes. So um, speaking of the lengthy process, like I have two questions that kind of follow up. Like how would you figure out your exposure? Because it's UV sensitive, right? Right. Yeah, so the chemistry is sensitive between the UV and the blue spectrum. Um, and in, in studio, um, you just kind of have to put as much light on them as possible. And uh, I, I, I do like test shots, so I, I know. The, the hard part comes when you start shooting outside. When you, when you have to measure light, you have to figure out the light. The light is always changing. Um, since it's UV sensitive, to, you can't tell when the start, you know, the sun, the sun start to go down the UV, UV just goes away very quickly, but you still have light. So you, your instinct is that I have enough light. But when you measure the UV, there is, you know, like very, very little. Um, so what I do is um, I have, um, I have a, a little app on my phone. Um, and then I, I set it to 0.8 uh, ISO and I measure the light and, and I kind of guess. So it's, if it's in the middle of the day, I can kind of trust it. And when the UV starts going away, I just have to kind of multiply that time or add to that time just, I mean, empirically to, to make it work. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And with this process, you can also kind of correct when you're developing because you see the image coming up. So you can stop it or you can push it a little bit longer. Um, so um, so it's, you know, just experience, I guess. And with your self-portraiture, the lenses you use don't have the shutter, I'm assuming? Do, no. Do you work with a team of people when you take them? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I take my husband actually um, sitting there and he he, he became very uh, very experienced doing the um, yeah, counting and uh, I tell him how long it takes how many seconds and sometimes he even gets it right yeah what's the largest size you able to produce it depends on the camera. But uh, you know, like you, like equipment, like can you do the old build like a larger than eight by ten, like a so, sixty by twenty or something? Yeah, I mean there there are they call it mammoth mammoth um, cameras or mammoth uh, web plates. Um, I I actually have an eleven by fourteen. I I just don't have the equipment for it because as you as you upgrade to larger sizes, you don't. It's not only the camera, you have to have a plate holder made for that size. You have to get a big tank for the silver, a bigger tank for the silver. You need more silver, which is really expensive. And so everything is bigger. So everything like kind of multiply and, um, and your budget kind of runs down. So, um, and then you need more chemistry to pour on the plate. So everything, everything is different in large, larger format. But uh, there are people who are, who are doing like, I don't know, this big plates or glass and, and then they use uh, there's a there's a guy in California, he's Chinese, and then he he has a he has a motorhome that created a, a dark room that the whole I think it's a it's a bus actually and then he made it made it to a dark room so he does this ultra large format um, glass or ambrotypes that um, yeah of landscape mostly so it's possible you just have to have the equipment and the money for that i don't have that money thank you thank you so much for coming